Good morning. God calls us to a feast. The table is set, and we will come from east and west, from north and south, to sit at Christ's table. The table is set, so come, let us worship God together. Welcome to the Wallace Presbyterian Church. It's good to have you here as we worship together on this cold winter day. Glad you made it here safely. Um, please take time to share the friendship pad and use it to greet one another by name. If you're a visitor here today, we especially welcome you in our worship. It's a special day as we come to the Lord's table for the sacrament and as we ordain and install elders in the class of 2020 for our session. Please take time to look through the announcements in the bulletin about things coming up in the life of this church. Um, a new Bible study begins tomorrow evening, Basic Bible 101, subtitle, Everything You Always Want to Know About the Bible But Were Afraid to Ask. We will meet more than one time. Um, no, really, if you, want, if you have some questions, come, bring your Bible, bring your questions. Um, if you want to come on Monday night from 7 to 8.30, we'll meet in the fellowship hall tomorrow night. Tuesday morning from 10 to 11.30, this week, We'll meet in room 304 across from the music room, um, and then we'll be back in the fellowship hall. If you happen to miss on a Monday night and are available Tuesday morning, it's the same thing other than whatever questions people might ask. So we'll be glad to have you, and I look forward to reading through the Bible with you and talking about what it means for our lives. Our all-church sound retreat is the first weekend of February. Uh, registrations are being accepted now, and the deadline is next Sunday, the 14th. I hope that if you're thinking about going, you'll go ahead and get your registration in. We've got a wonderful lineup for leadership, and it'll be a great time. It's good to be with you as we worship God today. sentences. Call to us, O Lord, and ask us to come to you. We come without fear, even though we do not know what the future holds for us. Give us courage and strength to be your disciples. Lord, we will come and follow you. Be present with us, O Lord, and inspire steps in your service. Our hymn number is 761, called as Partners in Christ's Service.
church are the heart of the gospel in every age. Our generation stands in a peculiar need of reconciliation in Christ. Let us confess our need, confident in God's forgiving grace. I invite you to join me in our unison prayer, silent prayers, and our responsive assurance of pardon. Let us pray. Mighty and merciful God, you have called us to be your people and claimed us for the service of Jesus Christ. We confess that we have not lived up to our calling. We have been timid and frightened disciples, forgetful of your powerful presence and the strength of your spirit among us. O oh God, forgive our foolish and sinful ways as you have chosen us and claimed us in our baptisms. Strengthen us anew to choose Christ's way in this world Give us your Holy Spirit that each one in ministry may be provided with all the gifts of grace needed to fulfill our common calling. Hear our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. <coughs> The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the God of mercy, who forgives us all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Let us sing God's praises for his mercy. <laughs> invite the children to join me on the steps for the children's sermon. soup pot this morning and I wanted and I filled it up with some things and I wanted to show you this is a uh, something I cook at home not very often because I have to have a ham before I can cook it and we have to eat most of the ham before I can cook this meal and it takes a long time to eat a ham but we like to leave a lot of ham on the bone I did not bring the ham bone it's in the freezer and I didn't want it to get frosted but here's what I do I'm putting all this stuff out. The night before, I take a whole bag of beans. This bag only has, it's only half a bag, but I take a whole bag of beans and I put them in this pot and I fill them up with water, fill it up with water, and I put a top on and I just let them soak all night long. And you know what happens to the beans? 
they get bigger and softer, but not really soft enough to eat. They're still kind of crunchy. The next morning, early in the morning, I go in and I dump all the water out and I wash the beans off and I put the beans back in there. And then I take a ham bone, which is about that big, it's got a lot of meat on it. And I put that down in there and I kind of push it all around and get the beans around. And then I fill it up with the water almost to the top, not quite to the top, to fill up the ham bone, cover the ham bone in the beans. And I put it on the burner and I let it cook for three hours very low it just kind of bubbles. I go in every once in a while and it starts smelling like cooking ham and beans and it smells good but it's just ham and beans and after three hours then I go back in and I chop up an onion and I put that in and some green onions and I put in tomato sauce and chili pepper and black pepper what else we got down there Miller garlic powder Bye. oregano leaves that comes later um, but you didn't know that thyme leaves parsley Tabasco sauce it's a whole bunch of stuff that goes in there and you chop all that up and put it all in there and stir it all up and put a lid on it and walk away for about an hour and a half and it just every once in a while I go back and I stir it and it starts cooking together and the beans get soft and the ham starts falling off oh I forgot after three hours I cut all the ham meat off the bone and I take the ham bones out. I put all that in and I cook for about an hour and a half. And then guess what you do? You turn it, not yet. <laughs> then you turn it off and you just let it sit. And then you go back after about an hour and you turn it back on and you let it start getting warm. And then, actually Miller, you don't put the rice in. You cook the rice separately and when it's ready, you put a rice in a big bowl and then you put that on top and it is so good and it makes so much of it and you know what's really strange is it may, it's better the second day it's better when you put it in the refrigerator and then heat it up the next day I think everything kind of mixes together and what's really nice about it other than a lot of work right at the beginning it cooks all day you don't have to do anything and then when it's supper time you got this delicious meal it makes so much plus I like doing it a lot of times I'll take some to some friends that I know like it because it's fun to share it. It's a very special meal. We don't have it very often, but it sure does last a long time and it sure is good. Now, after thank you so much, I'd like for you to, oh, this is the cookbook. I really don't even have to use a recipe anymore, but I do just to make sure. If you stand up here with me, look at what's on the table up here. We've got some bread, and we've got some juice, and we call it a meal. Now, it's not like that meal. It doesn't take that long to fix. Miss Harriet and Mr. Charlie fix it, and they cut up all the bread, and they put the bread in the trays. Come here, Claire. You want to see? And they put the juice in the cups. We don't have this meal very often. It's a very special meal. We have it about once every three months, and then we have it on Christmas Eve, and we have it right before Easter, and we have it at Camp Kirkwood. So it's a very special meal. And Mr. Charlie and Miss Harriet fix it, but they don't keep it to themselves. They share it. And in a few minutes, we're going to have communion, which another word for communion means sharing or fellowship. And people pass the bread to each other because it's like we're sharing the good news of Jesus. We like it so much, and it's such a special meal, we wanna share it with other people. And that's what we do when we have the Lord's Supper. It reminds us how much God loves us and that Jesus died for our sins. Let's have a prayer together, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this special meal, for good meals at home that we enjoy fixing and sharing with friends. And thank you for this special meal here at the church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Where are you going, Claire? Oh, you've dropped your money. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, y'all can go back to your seats. You can go over to Papa.
ready to hear God's word for us today, please join me in our prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Overwhelm us with your spirit, O God, that the words we hear will speak to our hearts as your word made known to us in Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. and you'll find that on page 57 in your pew Bibles. The next day Moses sat as the judges for the people, while the people stood around him from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another, and I make known to them the statutes and instructions of God. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you. For the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You should represent the people before God, and you should bring their case before God. Teach them the statutes and instructions, and make known to them the way they are to go and the things they are to do. You should also look for able men, and among all the people, men who fear God, are trust trustworthy, and hate dishonest gain. Set such men over them, as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you, but decide every minor case themselves so it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people will go to their home in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men from all Israel and appointed them as heads over the people. 
as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they judged the people at all times. Hard cases they brought to Moses, but any minor case they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went off to his own country. Our New Testament reading comes from the book of Acts, early in the book of Acts, chapter 6. The church is starting to grow, and we start hearing some stories about how the church deals with that and um, meets those challenges. So I invite you to listen for God's Word, Acts 6, 1 through 7. Now during those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews. The Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews. The Hebrews were Jewish-speaking Jews. And they were complaining because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the Word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was a commissioner from the Presbytery of Coastal Carolina to the 220th General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA in Pittsburgh in 2012, I served on the Church Orders and Ministry Committee. One of the items of business on our docket that week was how to refer to people who were ordained to positions of leadership in congregations in the Presbyterian Church USA. An overture was submitted to the General Assembly to amend our book of order to replace the terms teaching elder and ruling elder with minister of word and sacrament and elder. Part of the rationale for making this change in the proposed amendment said this, the word ruling in ruling elder evokes an authoritarianism that is foreign to the ministry of elders in the current church. In historic Presbyterian practice in Britain and the U.S., the ruling elders truly ruled, primarily as a disciplinary court. Old session minutes are often dominated by cases of Sabbath breaking, drunkenness, swearing, adultery, fornication, and other infractions by members of the congregations answered by various forms of public repentance imposed by the local session. The ruling elders of old even ruled on who was deemed to be duly prepared and ready to receive the Lord's Supper every time that it was dispensed. So ministers and elders would go around the week before communion was served and visit with members of the church and determine whether or not those people were worthy to come to the table and they were given a communion token that they had to have to come to church that day to come to the table. We debated this issue in our committee for a while, and ultimately the committee recommended to the entire General Assembly that the recommendation not be approved. So you might hear ministers of the Word and Sacrament referred to as teaching elders, and elders who serve in local congregations referred to as ruling elders. Today, during worship, we are going to ordain and install Christy Johnson, and Clay Blue, and Dan Robinson, and Michael Tichy. Dottie Obenauer is sick and can't be here today, unfortunately. 
We're going to ordain and install Christy. We're going to install the others as ruling elders in the church of Jesus Christ and for the Wallace Presbyterian Church. And according to our church's book of order, ruling elders are named not because they lord it over the congregation, but because they are chosen by the congregation to discern and measure its fidelity to the Word of God and to strengthen and nurture its life and faith. Several years ago, as our session talked about what it means to be a ruling elder, one of the elders asked, how in the world are we supposed to discern and measure the congregation's fidelity to the Word of God? That's a great question, and that's also one of the primary responsibilities that your elders and I have. And speaking as the moderator of our session, I can say that your elders take their responsibility to rule very seriously, not in the sense of lording it over the congregation, but as described in an article about ordination, ruling out or measuring the work of ministry, the fidelity of communal and personal lives, and the progress of the gospel in the church. I have yet to work with any ruling elders in the Wallace Presbyterian Church who want to lord it over the congregation. As part of their session examination for ordination and installation, the newly elected elders are asked to share their stories of faith in whatever form they want to share those stories. But I always ask them to to end up by answering this question. Why did you say yes when you were asked to serve as an elder in the Wallace Presbyterian Church? Hearing their stories and their reasons for serving is a highlight of the year for the session. And year after year after year after year, the men and women you elect to serve as ruling elders consistently share a desire to serve our Lord Jesus Christ the people of this congregation, our surrounding community, and the world at large. We Presbyterians are known for doing things decently and in order, and people make fun of us for that. But that's why we talk about the orders of ministries. But there's no hierarchy of power and prestige. The orders of ministries have to do with particular functions in the life of the church. Some people here try to make me in charge. You're the one in charge. No, I'm not. And that makes them unhappy when I tell them that. But the session is in charge. The elders are in charge. And I'm a part of the session. All Christians, every one of us, is called to service in the name of Jesus Christ. That work isn't just for ordained ruling elders and teaching elders. But there are particular ministries and jobs to be done in the church. And from the very beginning, we heard a story this morning. The church has set aside people for those particular tasks. In the book of Acts, we read about the new church experiencing growing pains and some conflicts that arise because of the growing church. Some Greek-speaking Jewish Christians thought that their widows were being neglected in the Meals on Wheels program, the distribution of food, maybe on a daily basis. They went to the 12 apostles, and they complained, or at least they shared their concern. And to their credit, instead of getting defensive, instead of ignoring the problem, instead of saying, well, we'll do it ourselves, the apostles came up with a good idea that pleased the whole church. Seven men were called out and designated to take care of that specific ministry to the widows, which left the apostles free to devote themselves to prayer and the serving of the Word of God. We should not read into this story some order of importance of tasks in the church. In other words, the apostles were not saying, we'll take care of the more important jobs, you know, like praying and preaching and teaching. We can't be bothered with the more menial tasks. That's not what they were saying. Instead, they recognized the importance of shared ministry and of the church calling people out to be responsible for particular ministries in the church so that all the work can get done. And that New Testament division of labor is very similar to Jethro's advice to his son-in-law Moses 
Jethro saw Moses trying to do everything by himself. And he asked, what, what are you doing? What is this you're doing for the people? What you're doing, son, is not good. You will wear yourself out, and you will wear out the people also, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. And that's why we elect elders every fall, and I'm glad we do. The task is too heavy for me. I cannot do it alone. Each year, I am very excited to get a phone call or an email from the chairperson of the nominating committee saying, Phil, we have a slate of nominees to present to the congregation. Just the other day, someone asked me, do you feel good about the folks who are coming on the session? And I enthusiastically said, yes, I do. And then I added, I always feel good about the folks who are coming on the session because the congregation always elects men and women who are committed to the ministry of this church and to the task of being an elder. When the apostles suggested to the church that they select seven men to serve, they encouraged them, listen, to select people of good standing, full of the Spirit, and full of wisdom. Our Book of Order says congregations should elect persons of wisdom and maturity of faith, having demonstrated skills in leadership and being compassionate in spirit. They should be persons of strong faith, dedicated discipleship and love of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Their manner of life should be a demonstration of the Christian gospel in the church and in the world. Without fail, elders elect say to me every year, I don't think I'm worthy to be an elder. And my answer is always, you're not and I'm not worthy to be a minister. And none of us is worthy of God's grace. But God chooses to work through us in His church. God gives us spiritual gifts to do the jobs that God calls us to do. I always tell ruling elders, remember, the congregation elected you to serve because they see in you qualities and characteristics needed in leaders of God's people. And that's why we talk about elders being called by God through the voice of this congregation. So that's what I tell ruling elders. Remember, you've been elected by your fellow church members. But let me remind all of us of this. We have not elected our ruling elders to do all of the work and ministry for us. We have elected our ruling elders to lead us all in the work and ministry God calls us to do. In our baptisms, God puts a claim on our lives, a claim of grace, a claim of love, and a call to service. In a few minutes, Elder Jason Rouse is going to ask you two questions as part of the ordination installation ceremony. Will you accept these men and women as elders in this church? And will you encourage them respect their decisions, and follow them as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who is alone head of the church. We are all called to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God that some are selected to serve as ruling elders, to guide, to nurture, to discern, and to measure our fidelity to the Word of God. Let us pray. Lord, strengthen the faith of your people through word and sacrament. Bless the members of our congregation that they may be salt and light in the world. Guide our elders as they nurture us in our faith and lead us in service to Christ our Lord and the people of this world. Amen. time I'm going to ask Elder Jason Rouse to come represent the session and I'll ask Clay and Christy and Dan and Michael to join us down front.
And if you would get your bulletin, I'm going to ask you to participate in just a second. Would you please join me in the opening words? There are different gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are varieties of ways to serve God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through people in different ways, but it is the same God who inspires a faithful response. Each one is given gifts by the Spirit to use for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked out as God's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples and servants of Christ our Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as elders and as ministers of the word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring us that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. Do we, the members of the oh, church, not yet. <coughs> to present them, did I not send that to you? Here we go. Representing the one Holy Catholic and Apostle Church, the session of the Wasp Presbyterian Church now ordains Christy Johnson to the office of ruling elder and installs Clay Blue, Christy Johnson, Dottie Obermeyer, Dan Robinson, and Michael Titi to active service on the session. Christy, Michael, Clay, and Dan have these constitutional questions to ask of you. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and Head of the Church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the Church Universal and God's Word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? And finally, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? We, the members of the church, accept these men and women as elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Amen. Ordination calls the whole church to a renewed commitment and reminds us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ that is given to us in the sacrament of baptism. If you're able, I invite you to stand and join in affirming the faith of the Holy Church with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. In the story from Acts, after the seven men were selected, you might remember me reading that they presented them to the apostles who prayed for them and laid their hands on them. It's a long-standing tradition that those being ordained would have the laying on of hands. At this time, I'm going to ask Christy to come forward. She's being ordained today to kneel and for all other elders here today and uh, ruling elders and teaching elders to come forward and be a part of the laying on of hands and the prayer of ordination. So if you would come. Not actively serving necessarily, but if you are an elder or a teaching elder. Let us pray. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit on Christy, Dan, Clay, and Michael, that they may be your faithful elders in the church. Give them prudence and sound judgment, wisdom and courage to order the life of the church in obedience to your word. Nourish them in the life of the Holy Spirit that they may exercise the ministry of discipline with humility and compassion. Guide them in governance on this session and in every court of the church that they may be servant leaders following Christ who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life to set others free. Give them joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for their work of ministry. Lord, we thank you for these men and women, for these leaders in our church. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Help Christy get up. <laughs> Christy, Clay, Dan, and Michael, you are now elders in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Jesus Christ. I invite you to extend the right hand of fellowship to these folks. Let's continue our worship as we present our tithes and our offerings.
pray. Everlasting God, you have demonstrated your great compassion in Scripture and throughout history. Thank you for calling us to show your compassion and uphold justice as members of the Church of Jesus Christ. We are grateful for opportunities to extend your love through the ministries of our church. Lord, use our gifts and offerings to help our neighbors who are in need of goods and of your Spirit's peace. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our hymn of preparation for the Lord's table is number 501. the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west, from north and south, and sit at table in the kingdom of our Lord. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples after his resurrection, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is our Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who put their trust in him to share the feast that he has prepared. Hear these words of institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also after supper, the Lord took the cup and when he had blessed it and given thanks, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it. The Apostle Paul reminds us that as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. As we come to the Lord in prayer today and as we enjoy fellowship with one another and communion with our Lord, let us remember all those who could not be here with us today because of the cold and the weather and for whatever other reasons. And uh, keep these folks in your hearts and in your prayers this week. We particularly remember the pastor and members of the Rose Hill United Methodist Church whose sanctuary burned down last week on January 1st. And we will be uh, in touch with them, finding out what their needs are and joining with other people in the communities to help them recover. We want to pray for the family of Bo Rouse who died on Friday. Uh, his service will be tomorrow, connected with the Duplin Nursery. Sympathy to Jill Johnson and her family on the death of her father, Max Tichy, on January 1st, and to Lenny Ward and his family on the death of his mother, Barbara Ward, on January 1st, and to Hope Turnbull on the death of her aunt. Also, we want to continue to pray for Andrea Castine and her whole family as she recovers from her second round of chemotherapy, two down and one to go, and let us lift them up. And congratulations to Kurt Simpson and Vera Coombs on their marriage on January 5th. Let us pray together. 
Eternal God, our Creator, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. You formed us in your image, loved us with an everlasting love, and graced us with gifts for serving. In covenant with your people Israel, you raised up leaders, judges, kings, and prophets to show us your path of truth and nurture us in righteousness. When we were faithless and would not follow, you forgave us, returned us to your way. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, your only beloved Son, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. By your Spirit, he anointed all who would follow him to live a new life in your love. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Baptized as one among us, he received the gift of your Spirit and claimed his calling as a servant of your reign. Jesus proclaimed good news to the poor and by the power of your word set people free from all that bound them. He broke open the bread of life for all who were hungry and upon the hurt and the lost poured out the living waters of your grace. Then in humble obedience, Jesus went to his death on the cross and was raised by power to reign in glory. In the resurrection, the gifts of his spirit were poured out upon your people that the church might embrace his ministry and live as his body in the world. Gracious God, remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this cup from the gifts you have given us. We celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our very lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. As our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. When we break the bread, is it not the sharing in the body of Christ? Friends, the body of Christ given for you.
we've started making available gluten-free bread. Does anybody need that? When we give thanks over the cup, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The blood of Christ shed for you.
Let's pray. Gracious God, you have gathered us at this table with all the company of your people in heaven and on earth. In your mercy, we have been nourished by the living bread, Jesus Christ, and we've been refreshed by the power of your Holy Spirit. May we who have shared this holy meal go out as glad disciples of our Lord, following in his way, proclaiming his truth, and living his love for all your children in this world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn is number 177, I Will Come to You, You Are Mine. into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. Amen.